Namaskar. April 30th, 2021. This is episode number 153 of Daily Global Insights with Sri and Sri. Sridhar ji, time is flying and we are end of, at the end of another weekend, sir. We are and uh, momentous week uh, and we are into the sixth trillion of uh, stimulus. We have had 100 days of uh, Biden's presidency and there's plenty of activity in uh, US and there's plenty of activity around the world. India's rising pandemic, um, global challenges abound in Asia and silently Europe battles on with it's COVID and, uh, you know, re-establishing the NATO. I think one of the interesting questions somebody posed to us, what is the new global uh, order looks like? Uh, I don't think anybody knows what the global order looks like because we are now living in a very chaotic world. And uh, let's first start by listening to some feedback on Biden's speech of yesterday. Senator Graham says Biden embraced socialism and made Obama look like Reagan. Senator Tim Scott says socialist dreams will not help America to thrive. Biden urges Congress to act and says 1.8 trillion will help families. We are in competition with China to win the 21st century, he says. Sir, your thoughts first on Biden's speech on how the senators from the Republican Party have responded. Basically, I think there's a unanimous consent amongst the Republican uh, Party. It doesn't matter whether it's Lindsey Graham or Tim Scott who gave the rebuttal to uh, Biden's speech or whether it is um, uh, Rand Paul or whether it is Ted Cruz. There's a consistent thing, which is namely that Biden is pushing United States to precipice and driving the socialist agenda. Now, to their credit, they are backed by uh, AOC or Alexandria Cortez, Ocasio Cortez, who says that it is the progressives who are driving the democratic agenda and they have to be given due credit for the policies that is coming out of the Biden administration. So therefore, on four factors, one on the economy, they say that it is moving to socialism. Number two, on the stimulus, their view is that the stimulus is disproportionate, putting us into the binge. On the surge, on the immigration, they are overtly critical. It is creating a potential security issue in the country. And then in the, on the final matter, which is around this whole racial equality and other things, they are forcing an agenda that doesn't align. Somewhere around that is the fifth, which is the gun control. Um, and clearly that is going to be highly contested. So this is the Republican rebuttal to Biden's plan. Now, progressives are quick to take credit for the big spending plan. They say that we are setting the agenda for Democratic Party. Americans are growing wary of Biden big spending game and American rescue plan, jobs plan, child plan, all of them put together is going to cost about 6.1 trillion. Sir, who do you think is the leader of the progressives? The leader of the progressives is, uh, you know, uh, um, there is a little bit of a leadership battle, which is between, uh, you know, Alexandria Cortez versus Bernie Sanders. I think Sanders is at his, uh, you know, um, what I call at this point of his career, he's very happy as long as his agenda is driven. So this young group led by uh, Cortez, whether Pramila Jaipal would accept or whether the other two people... Uh, uh, Elman and uh, Rashida would they accept? We don't know, but clearly, uh, the lady who is making big news on this progressive agenda is uh, Miss Cortez. And um, forty-seven percent support and twenty percent or forty percent disapprove for job plan is hardly a support. That's what people say. And Biden draws ire from Republicans and pushback from Democrats on the spending spree. Clearly, even some of the Democrats are embarrassed about the amount of money that President Biden wants to spend. Well, I think uh, once they saw the plan, uh, which is uh, given by the Republicans, uh, this is around the uh, around the uh, the two trillion. We're not talking about 1.8 trillion as yet. The two trillion, they felt that there's a lot of money that is being thrown away. And the only way to unwind that, the only way to get that plan through is through filibuster because Republicans, including those eight uh, Republican senators who generally tend to align with uh, Mr. Biden, uh, are against the plan. 
It is these eight people along with the other GOP who proposed this uh, $547 million plan. So it's very clear that there is very little support. There are some Republicans led by Munchin uh, who say that, you know, uh, filibuster... You mean Democrats? A uh, Democrat, sorry. Uh, Democrat, Munchin, and who says that, you know, this is not the way to go. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to have a much more uh, cohesive and committed if you're going to spend this type of money. And Vice President Kamala Harris agrees with Senator Tim Scott that America is not a racist country. I, I don't know why people even have this kind of doubt. America is one of the most free countries. It express, allows people to express their thoughts and views. So I don't know why they keep visiting this question, sir. But please let me know what your thoughts are. My thought is that when you have a specific agenda, uh, when you collaborate it with, uh, with, with incidents or facts, um, that doesn't align with your objective, uh, then you get into this kind of chaos. Their objective is, the Democrats' objective is to come up with a reparation bill and regret and compensate for the people who have been impacted as a result of the slavery. Now, to achieve that goal, you have, you can use a set of tools and communication uh, to, to move towards that and make sure those communities really benefit. When you look at the last five presidencies, much has been talked about this, but the community from a per capita point of view has remained still uh, well below the acceptable levels. Then you add on top of that uh, the whole concept of uh, racism and the racial theory and try to, uh, you know, push it into the from school systems to college systems and create a whole paraphernalia around the history and the psyche of the people. Then you're just going to lose a lot of people including those who otherwise would have supported. That is the reason why it's very interesting, uh, Vice President Harris has said, I agree with you, Mr. Scott, who did the rebuttal, that America is not a bigot, not a racist country. So I agree with you. So it's a very interesting, uh, you know, rebuttal by Harris herself, who is a vice president. And... Uh under, in crime news, cops are under siege with raising or a rising wave of violence, whether it is Delaware or Baltimore or North Carolina. Now, these three states have also joined the existing list of uh, uh, Portland and Minnesota, sir. Portland, Minnesota, Washington, D.C., New York, Atlanta. You, you know, you, the list is growing, right? Um, well, Delaware, there was an incident of uh, the cop being, uh, you know, beaten up. Uh, in Baltimore, there has been sporadic incidents of uh, um, activity. North Carolina, at least you can expect some trigger because of the uh, uh, a specific shooting incident that occurred. But what you're beginning to see is a systematic pattern of uh, wherever you find opportunities uh, for creating or inflicting this social uh, unrest or crime. Uh, this is uh, this is especially the cops. They are very specifically targeting uh, the cops. And Biden floats compromise on immigration plan and he would like to pass what is agreed on on both sides of the aisle. And in an unusual ruling, SCOTUS rules illegal immigrants can avoid deportation on a technicality. So your thoughts? Um, on the first point, I think uh, Biden has come up with, uh, you know, three essential categories. One is, uh, you know, the, uh, the long term or dreamers. The second is unaccompanied children. Uh, and the third category is those who are in the uh, protected employment, long-term protected employment category. He believes that is one third of the list. So at least we should agree that we should give an amnesty and harmonize them uh, into the society rather than uh, be uh, limited in scope. So it's you can see, again, the flip-flop, just like the infrastructure, uh, you have a flip-flop again uh, happening around this. As far as the SCOTUS is concerned, this was uh, yesterday's uh, ruling. Uh, there was apparently, there is a process called, you have to issue notice. And you have to issue notice to this illegal migrant to appear in the court. And the notice should be one single notice. So this, uh, the, the, the federal authorities have given multiple notices to him. Multiple notices to him on the issue, maybe one clarifying the other. Uh, there is a there is a technical uh, technicality which is called you can only one issue, and typically and when you reach the ten year, then the whole thing stops, um, and then you can you know you just have to get this done within that time frame. 
So he said, a rule of law is a rule of law. The rule of law states that, uh, you know, he has not been given one single notice. He has been given multiple notices. Um, this is Mr. Chivez, uh, Andy Chivez, uh, who, uh, who made this case. And now what happens, uh, his continuation in the country or harmonization or normalization or integration in the country is determined at the discretion of Department of uh, Attorney General uh, uh, of, of the nation. I mean, you know, the Attorney General of the nation is very supportive and sympathetic to the, uh, the illegal. So therefore, this gentleman is going to be um, given. So governments are no exception anywhere in the world. Only the sophistication varies. They constantly bungle on many of the issues, which results in uh, not a very optimal outcome. And um, GOP senators call for probe of John Kerry over alleged intel sharing with Iran. So we've touched upon this a few days ago. Now the chorus is growing, isn't it? The co especially the GOP senators. I think there's about 20 or 22 of the GOP senators uh, who in the Senate raised the issue. This is a very serious affair. Uh, and he must first step down uh, because there is a very clearly uh, a video, uh, sorry, an audio. Plus there is also... Uh, you know, Iran, uh, the the head of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, Iran Foreign Affairs or Foreign Minister is making this claim. So there must be some substantive truth to it, if this is the case. Um, and uh, so he must step down, and investigation must commence. And if it has happened, this happened. Right, remember, not now, but under the uh, previous Obama administration. And in India news, India and Russia agree on a 2 plus 2 in Diplomatic Balancing Act. So now even Russia is beginning to make the same kind of overtures. Look, I think we, as I said, this is a classic example of what is the new global order. Um, when you take a look at this, uh, there was this, whatever the meeting outcome with Mr. Lazaro, um, it didn't turn out to be fairly successful. Our perceived impressions is that media coming out is um, some communication that propped up around whether he's visiting Pakistan or not visiting Pakistan or what, etc. But now it says Mr. Modi has met with Vladimir. They have a deep bondage, old friendship. We are comrades and you like, you know, hug shoulders and so on. I know, I, you know, there are several experts in P gurus and each has uh, an opinion, but my opinion in this, on this matter is, yes. this is not look, this is not good in my view. But three here are three reasons. One, Europeans are very strong allies of India, like France, and the Europeans are fighting Russia in Europe, especially around Ukraine and Crimea. Crimea. Then you have Russia, Iran, and Russia, uh, China, and in South China Sea. India is fighting with Japan and Australia, and not necessarily Russia has great ties. They have great ties with, with, uh, with uh, China. That's one matter. The second, when you look at the historical Russian association with India, people forget that very much India developed as a socialistic state on the basis of the Russian model. And I keep referring all the time. It takes, it took India more than 50 years, somewhere between 50 to 60 years using this socialistic model to reach the 1 trillion uh, economic uh, GDP outcome. And whereas it has reached the next two, next two trillions in less than 14 years or less than 12 years, as the case may be because of the pandemic, we had uh, numbers uh, contraction and that resulted in coming back uh, to 3 trillion. I'm talking about nominal GDP. So that's the second. The third I think there's enough evidence written about the deep state presence of Russians within the Indian political ethos and ecosystem. So these are, in my view, the, when I look at these three reasons to come back, uh, to go back and say we are back to camaraderie uh, and we will do your two plus two, potentially putting other things at risk uh, is, you know, to me looks like, a, you know, uh, Biden, um, uh, Biden is rubbing off his flip flop strategy to Mr. Modi as well. Um, sir, in exit polls for the state assembly elections that took place in uh, in India, uh, there is a clear verdict in Assam, Tamil Nadu, Puducherry, and Kerala with a close contest in West Bengal. 
I will share the results of our poll. We have been doing polls on Twitter polls on uh, our uh, accounts also. But first, you tell me what you think is going. Who you think is going to win, sir? No, it's not what I think. It's what the Indian media is projecting, and yes. uh, and they have been frequently wrong. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so Assam, they are predicting uh, NDA. Tamil Nadu, they are predicting a thumping victory for uh, DMK. Uh, in Puducherry, they are predicting uh, NDA. In Kerala, they are predicting Mr. Piranayi to come back. Um, they are giving a little bit of an edge to uh, to BJP in West Bengal, but they think it's a very close contest. So this is the numbers that I have seen. So according to our poll, which is like a sampling of about 1,000 people in each of the, these, in Assam, Tamil Nadu, and West Bengal, um, BJP is coming to power, NDA is going to come to power, Puducherry, of course, and Kerala, it's still a tough fight, although the numbers I'm seeing is unbelievable. They are saying that BJP is going to get a lot of seats, and, and that I'm not so sure. Maybe single digits I see happening, not sure if we can get double digits, but we will wait and see. We've been frequently wrong before too. So next news is Indian private sector continues its momentum with oxygen battle. Tata Steel increases production to 800 tons. And Commonwealth countries and Taiwan extend support to India. UP receives record supplies of oxygen amid rising cases. Sir, this augurs well that India seems to have found its feet as far as managing the oxygen supply is concerned. I think it, uh, uh, the, the growing momentum from around the world and the elevated uh, production levels and Indian enterprises, corporate enterprises stepping in, and many of them even uh, reaching out to the adjacent countries like Singapore, UAE, and so on, uh, and airlifting the oxygen uh, and then getting it to the appropriate venues, which, which is, uh, you know, UP, Delhi, uh, Maharashtra, uh, you know, even Rajasthan, MP, um, and maybe even Karnataka. These are the uh, flag states. Nothing is mentioned about what's happening in West Bengal. Probably West Bengal is inaccessible because of the elections and so on. But West Bengal and Kerala are two states where you do have, you know, high number of cases and fatalities. Uh, not much is there. But the good news is that it is reaching... The also, the other good news is, notwithstanding these big numbers, 379, 459 new cases coming up, the general impression that I get is that uh, the curve is flattening in terms of the, the new cases. Uh, this is the impression that I, uh, that uh, this is the message, but perhaps, you know, my uh, set of people, you know, may have a specific views and that may be different to what the reality is, but there is a general impression as the vaccination level grows up, uh, you know, things are likely to be much more, much better controlled than what we have seen in the last 10 days. And in global news, Taiwan's new Coast Guard flagship is going to counter China's gray zone threat. Could you please expand on this, sir? Well, what's happening is that we, we have three zones. One is the gray zone. And then you have the um, uh, economic um, economic. Um, uh, what you call economic uh, economic uh, zone and uh, economic independent zone, and then you have uh, the the narrow strait, which is the maritime neutral waters. So, the gray zone is one which poses um, very serious and imminent threat. Uh, the economic uh, independent zone, just as we had in um, uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, where you had the crossings. So you find that uh, they are not, they are more warning signs, but those which when you enter the gray zone, um, that means you have effectively entered uh, what you call as the hostile territory and uh, uh, posing an imminent threat. So the China is enhancing, I mean, uh, Taiwan is enhancing uh, its uh, flag, Coast Guard flagship uh, to make sure that it can counter any kind of intrusions into these gray zones. And uh, in other China-related news, Japan expresses concern over China's military expansion plans. Chinese military says General Rawat assertion that China tried to change status quo in La uh, eastern Ladakh is inconsistent with facts. Tibetans see repeat of own repression in China treatment of Uyghurs. Chinese lease of Port Darwin open to review. So we have a lot of things again happening around China. 
and uh, they'll lie through their teeth. That's all I can say, sir. Well, um, there is a significant credibility capital issue between China and you can see here many nations, Taiwan, Japan, India, Tibet, Australia, all involved in this quagmire, let alone uh, Philippines and uh, 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 and United States. So there is a quagmire uh, that is developing. Um, and the fact that the Australian Prime Minister and the Australian Foreign Minister have talked about uh, whether the uh, whether Port Darwin is, uh, you remember that we yesterday we talked about augmentation of the defense plan in terms of preparedness. Uh, Port Darwin is one of the uh, ports where Australia plans to enhance its um, airport, cap um, air force airport capabilities uh, in terms of uh, protecting uh, the matter uh, the borders. So the common theme here is that the China is single-handedly posing significant problems. And that is being expressed one after the other around the world. Is anyone going to do anything about it? The answer is no. There's a lot of bravado. So this is another example of uh, the new, new uh, global order. The new global order, one player has stood out, and that is China. China has very categorically and clearly stood out and says, I make the rules everybody follows. It doesn't matter which facet we are dealing with. So you have a China. Are there nations aligned with it? Maybe silently and subtly some nations are. Then you have Russia, which says, I'm very opportunistic and I'm, I will navigate whichever way I feel comfortable. And I may even partner with, with uh, India and partner with China as appropriate. So you have a second. Then you have a massive confusion. This is not the case as, as it used to be. Once upon a time, United States used to lead the world and had a set of allies and took a strong position. And we began to see to some extent under Trump, but we are seeing that very fast, very quick dissipate under Biden. And in uh, Turkey-related news, full lockdown takes effect in Turkey as people start leaving cities. What is this regarding? Sir? Is it COVID or some other fear? COVID. COVID. It's COVID. It's COVID. It's uh, spreading. It's now Turkey is moved into top 10. Uh, it's fast moving towards, uh, you know, top five. It's fast spreading. Uh, so we are what we are referring to is um, uh, is COVID. Obviously, cities are, you know, concentrated, urban concentrated uh, locations. So that's what we're seeing. And in global COVID update, in global COVID update, the world is going to spend $157 billion on COVID vaccines by 2025. Fauci says US should see a turning point in pandemic in the next few days. MIT study says time spent indoors could increase the pandemic six feet of or 60 feet. Outdoor guidance echoes what many Americans already do. So now as this thing unlocks, I think people are now putting into place something where people can safely move about in outdoor also, isn't it, sir? It is. I think we discussed this. This is the problem with research, like uh, like uh, you know some of the economic predictions or some of the weather predictions. Everybody has a hindsight. I think we talked extensively about this. That people outdoor, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Shiva, he has also spoken about why people have to be outdoors. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Sriji, that you shared me that video. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's spoken quite nicely about it. Anyway, so vitamin, and a, vitamin A and vitamin D are essential. Vitamin A is available in food and vitamin D is available outside. So you can't be inside uh, uh, confines. That's why they say whether you're six feet or 60 feet, being indoors is not very helpful. And in markets related news, consumer fuel economy pushes GDP to 6.4% first quarter gain. Wow. We, we were thinking 4.5. Now it's a clear 2% more than expected, sir. No, this is just a first quarter. And we yeah, made, first quarter. Made, yeah. made, so we, once annualized, we are seeing 4.3. But remember, we already talked about uh, north of 6% movement. These early signs indicate that maybe we'll finish with a much higher number between 6 and 8%. So the trends at least are pointing out uh, that the economy is moving. This is endorsed by... Fed chairman, which is to say, economy on its momentum, 
there is inflation possibilities and uh, we may not do interest rate changes in 2021, but we are taking a cautious look at what's happening. And jobless claims fell to their lowest pandemic level. S&P and Dow hit records after record earnings. And Bitcoin and tech soar as Biden stimulus signing feeds risk rally. And we can see some numbers like Amazon. Its sales have surged 44% as it smashes earnings expectations. The earnings EPS was $15.79 versus 9.54 EPS. Revenue was $108.52 billion versus $1.4.47 billion. Amazon crossed 200 million Prime subscribers versus 150 million at the beginning of the year. That is impressive growth for Amazon, sir. Indeed. Uh, one correction is 108.52 billion versus 10.5. 104.47 oh i see i see so it's 4 billion more than expected yeah 104.47 billion uh, this is based on the forecast of the analysts but overall the sales grew by 44 percent uh the eps you see increased quite dramatically if you recall in the last quarter we we touched on this that there were provisions made for pandemic to the to the tune of about three billion dollars uh, three to three and a half billion dollars increased safety facilities, you know, better kind, you know, increased wages, um, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was a provision, and they had said they would wind it down in the first quarter. So uh, the fact is that the pandemic has led uh, more and more consumption shifting. This is the disruptive transformation that we have been referring to, uh, and sales surging. Uh, in the retail stores, uh, online retail of Amazon. The other key number is they now have crossed 200 million Prime subscribers versus 150 at the beginning of 2020. Not when, and when I say beginning of the year, not the beginning of 2021, because these are numbers relates to um, the the last year. So 2020, um, they have grown, you know, pretty close to 30 uh, percent. 35% in the uh, in the prime membership numbers. And with that, we bring our today's segment to a close. Have a great weekend, folks, and namaskar. Namaskar. So can I just wrap up with one uh, important, uh, one important. Uh, folks, you need to take a look at this. World to spend 157 billion on COVID-19. Look at all the companies which are in the vaccine business and look at the incremental revenue that is going to flow from this 157 billion. Make your own judgment if you are in investing business and you want to invest in some of the stocks. So that's my first observation. The second observation that I have is, uh, which I was briefly talking to uh, Sriji about, while there is this pandemic, I analyzed about 20, the most recent um, earning projections and earning reports of no less than 20 to 20 companies across a range of sectors, you know, ranging from automobile to telecom and so on and so forth. You find that while there is the, the deep anguish and so on, people have consumed out of their, out of their uh, you know, wallets like no one's business because all these companies have reported and there's a one common line pandemic, pandemic in this, including Deutsche Bank, which has reported best earnings relative to the past seven years. So there seems to be some message here. While there is anguish, there is no relentless, there is relentlessness in terms of unleashing the wallet, perhaps stimulus, which implies that with more stimulus to come, at least in United States, you can see markets going further north as the year rolls out. Thank you very much, Sridharji, and Namaskar. Namaskar.